Maybe in the last 10 years, we started realizing the gut influenced your brain. It was like the second brain. The brain neurotransmitters, most of them are produced in the gut. Girl, you've got questions. Questions about your body and how to feel good in it, about your hormones and how to keep them in check. Questions about your sex life and your whole health. Can you imagine having a best girlfriend who was also a triple board certified OBGYN? A girlfriend doctor you could call and ask or tell her anything. Someone who could show you how to live any stage of life before, during, or after menopause in a big, bold, and beautiful way. Well, friends, I'm your girlfriend doctor. I believe you were meant to flourish and shine, to embrace life and awaken to all its possibilities. Let's get there together. Welcome to our show. Hey everyone, welcome to the Girlfriend Doctor Show. I'm your host, Dr. Anna Kabeca, and I'm here to talk about a really important issue that affects all of us. And it is the number one killer of Americans today and worldwide, the number one killer for both men and women. And many women don't realize this, but the number one killer in women is heart disease. And it shows up differently than in men. It's like this, we call it oftentimes the silent killer because you don't know you have it till disease has been going on for a long time and then you're symptomatic. And so we've got to figure out the underlying ways to do that. And certainly you've been following my messaging and my keto green plan and, and that is absolutely a step in the right direction. I want to dig into more on this issue of heart disease and especially as it affects women with a dear friend and a dear colleague of mine, Dr. Stephen Masley, a gentleman I've known for over a decade. He's not only an amazing physician, he's a nutritionist and a trained chef. I know I love that part too. He's also a creator of one of the top health programs on PBS called 30 Days to a Younger Heart. He's published multiple bestseller books, including the 30 Day Heart Tune-Up and um, the Mediterranean diet. His latest book is a new and revised 30 day heart tune up book, his revised 30 day heart tune up. And um, it really is designed, and I've seen this work in action to prevent and reverse, I'm gonna say that again, reverse heart disease. And that's what we want, wherever you're at, it's not a death sentence. We can reverse heart disease and we've seen it over and over again. And I encourage you to join me in this discussion and we're gonna hit some really key pearls from the four key ways that he works to address heart disease, what you know, the, the modern medical approach is, what to really focus on from that and embrace and what maybe needs to be fine-tuned or trashed, right? And so as a clinician, as an expert in this field, as someone who's been working for an over, you know, decades helping people with heart disease and hypertension, this is important information for you. So I'm glad you're here. And here we go. Well, hello, Stephen. It is great to have you on the Girlfriend Doctor Show again. I am so happy to have this time with you. Well, Anna, it's always a delight to get to talk with you. <laughs> well, I see you are coming from your home. Normally, you're exploring the world on your sailboat. So uh, you've been uh, in, I've been in that kitchen many times, cooking up some amazing Mediterranean and some keto green, amazing dishes. I think that, you know, one of the things that I love about you is your food as medicine approach. And, you know, and I, I want our listeners, you guys, I've interviewed Dr. Stephen Masley before, and we've had great conversations. So um, you'll have to check out those Girlfriend Doctor Show interviews and, and, and get in on that. I really want to focus on today what I'm so honored to bring him here, back here on the show for to talk about his new revised edited version of his best-selling book, you know, The Heart Tune-Up. And so I want you, you have that there, Stephen, to show it? I do. I got, here we go. 30-day heart tune-up. And so what's really important is that like in, um, you know, in your writing, in your clinic, in your practice, in your life, I mean, 
you, you walk, you know, you walk the talk a thousand percent. Again, I've been in your kitchen. I've seen you love hanging out with you and your beautiful wife, Nicole and your family. And, um, and this, and being in your clinic too, it is just amazing that you're so, you've been so data driven. So not only do you know the research, do you know the food as medicines, you come from a nutritional perspective, but clinically you watched and watched and watched people heal from coronary vascular disease. So I want you to talk about why the, you know, why the heart is so important and, and this, you know, entire issue with cardiovascular disease and why also we're going to get into, but you guys, right before we started, Dr. Masley was like, you know, the gut microbiome is getting that healthy is so much more important than your cholesterol number. And so just let that sink in for a second, because that is just powerful, a powerful statement, because what is our, you know, world always doing our medical systems always like looking at your cholesterol and looking at your numbers. So, and, and, you know, managing that and supposed to increase our quality of life and longevity, but it really doesn't. So, all right. I'm so excited to talk to you about this and the new research. Well, as you said, the heart is super important, you know, for men and women, heart disease, it's still the number one killer for Americans today and for most of the Western world. So I think many people, especially women, underappreciate how a big a factor it is in their health. I think most people are aware that heart disease is the number one killer for men. And most women actually think that breast cancer is probably one of the number one killers for women. But for every one woman who dies of breast cancer, six women die from heart disease. So they're both important, but I think heart disease is a huge issue from what we die from. But it also impacts, as you know, how we live. Your circulation impacts the perfusion of your tissues, which means your energy, how your vitality, how well you feel. It also, as you and I have discussed many times, your circulation determines sexual function. It's kind of obvious for men um, that if they don't have good circulation, they don't have good function. But for women, it's critical for sensitivity, for lubrication, for all those issues that are important for enjoying sexual function. So, well, you know, I want to harp on that a second because we got to talk about this because erectile dysfunction is a symptom of heart disease. And it's, it's a huge symptom of heart disease. And it is so true. And men are going untreated. They're just getting, I mean, it's important to manage your blood pressure, but they're just getting their blood pressure managed and their cholesterol. And they're not addressing the underlying issue, even to the extent of, you know, like a, a simple recommendation, like work out at the gym four times a week, doing high intensity interval training. Let's just so let's just start there or somewhere, right? Because that circulation is such an issue. But as a gynecologist working with women in my medical practice, what I, you know, seeing the changes with aging and from that loss of, of good blood supply, we see the vaginal dryness, the loss of the elasticity of the vagina. And let's just talk about clitoral atrophy. I mean, I know everyone on my podcast is like, oh, there she goes again, the most important real estate of the body. I just going to talk about it. And it's so true. It's so true. <laughs> but it, it, it happens on a, you know, on a, uh, a it, it happens just like it happens to men. And it happens a lot, it starts happening a lot sooner for women. And it's really underappreciated that circulation is, a, yes, hormones have an impact, but the circulation impacts the, the, the cellular function of your tissue and whether you're thriving, flourishing, or dwindling. And I, I, my goal is to avoid dwindling. It's sexual, <laughs> sexual shrinkage. We don't want that. Oh, no. Mm -mm, no. Mm -mm. Yep, I'm with you on that. And so let's talk about how, like, how a, a, a standard workup is for to preventing heart disease. And, you know, this is... This really, again, no pun intended, but this is a subject really dear to my heart. I mean, I went into medicine because at age 16, I remember coming home from school one day and my house was empty. Normally my mom was there cooking up a storm. Everyone, you know, the neighborhood kids would come with me because they were sure to be cookies or something yummy baked and ready straight out of the oven for us. And the house was dead quiet. And she was 52 years old, undergoing coronary bypass surgery, three vessels. And at that point, it was, you know, and, and heart disease runs on both sides of my family, but specifically my mom's side with 
in 40s, 50s, certainly. And, and unfortunately, she died prematurely at 67, undergoing a second heart surgery. And so that really took me in this trajectory of understanding and trying to understand more of, of what, what happened in this situation. So I want to just quickly address like signs and symptoms of heart disease in, in women and men, but you know, um, so signs and symptoms of heart disease and, and the current way it's worked up. And then we're going to address, you know, how we believe is, is the, the right way to work it up and address it and reverse heart disease. Well, the standard approach today is we basically, we look at a few risk factors, cholesterol, blood pressure, blood sugar. And we put people, and if those aren't at target, we put them on drugs that make them feel worse. And then we wait for something bad to happen. We're not measuring function or artery age or anything else. Sadly, and I'm being a little cynical here, but it's the reality of our situation. We wait for something bad to happen, a heart attack, a stroke, death, or some need for a major procedure. And those procedures, as both of us know, on a personal level, can be um, either have major consequences or deadly. So to me, that's just totally backwards, that we can prevent 90% of heart disease with just pure lifestyle changes, yet we choose to spend 90% of all the money treating heart disease on end-stage procedures and hospital care. We might spend 9% on drug therapy for and measuring cholesterol, blood pressure, and blood sugar. But we only probably spend 1% on prevention, but we could prevent 90, as I said, 90% of all heart disease and make people feel so much better with the right lifestyle changes. So that's my goal, is to turn that 1% of where our focus is to the 90% and help anyone who's motivated feel fantastic, improve their energy, their quality of life, their sexual function, and prevent heart disease. I mean, that's easily achievable if we know what to do. That's a huge statement. Like, definitely want people to share this statement because that your quote, we can prevent 90% of heart disease I mean, that's huge. We can prevent 90% of heart disease and increase the quality of life that we see all the way around and, and the quality of, of healthy relationships. So let's talk about the signs and symptoms of, of early heart disease. So, I mean, the classic one we hear about is angina, chest pressure. And for men, that's actually true. They'll get pressure in their chest, short of breath, nauseated, maybe dizzy. But women really typically don't get that classic angina pattern. They just might feel short of breath when they're out working, or they just might feel fatigued. So they experience it differently, and they're oftentimes misdiagnosed. But let's face it, if we're waiting for that level of symptom, it's really late. It's really late. A sign is sexual dysfunction. As we lose circulation, we men and women have sexual dysfunction. So if men are having erectile dysfunction, oftentimes the doctor just pats them on the back, gives them by Viagra, doesn't even think that their arteries are being clogged and this could be reversed and prevented. I, that's, the, I think, the reality. But for women also, you know, if they're getting dryness or decreased sensitivity, um, less sexual enjoyment, that's oftentimes a sign of decreased circulation. So. I would change that around and look at our risk factors differently. One, I would start having people measure their artery plaque age. How old are their arteries with ultrasound? And assess that, something you've seen me do in the office, in the clinic. And um, I would be looking at factors that are super important, like nutrient intake. What food should we eat? What food should we avoid? As you mentioned, exercise, and it's fit about fitness, being fit, that high intensity workout that gives you fitness, and stress management. Those are the things that are super important and make a dramatic difference in how we feel and how we live. There's so much misinformation, but when you said um, the, that, you know, signs and symptoms for women is like shortness of breath and fatigue. Oh my gosh, Stephen, I'm doing this ritual one yoga class here in Dallas. I swear it's where all the, you know, the, the yoga teachers and fitness instructors go. I mean, and then there's me in the back, but today, oh, I think, I think I was having angina. 
<laughs> I think I was. It was 103 degrees and oh Lord, I was dehydrated really. But no, but seriously, you think, okay, well, I'm 54, family history of heart disease on both sides. You know, of the, you know, I'm, I'm doing everything right, but I haven't had my carotid intimal artery um, thickness measured in, um, in my carotid artery intimal thickness, right? How do I say that? C-I-M-T. Intimal medial thickness. Yes, you said it right. Carotid IMT, carotid intimal medial thickness. How thick are the walls of your arteries, meaning how old are your arteries? Yeah, and so that's a crucial piece, and I haven't had that done. I'll come visit you and we'll get it done. But, you know, I mean, that's a, I haven't had it done in maybe 10 years, and 10 years ago it was you know, pretty darn good, but let's, let's catch up. Right. And how often That's a good do you point? So yes, you did that in our office, maybe what 10, it, it might've been 12 years ago. No, I think it was 2013. I think okay. it was 2013, 2012, okay. 2013, 2013. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 2013. So almost right, like what? Yeah. A long enough ago that I need to do it again. And hopefully you'll be young on, you look as young on the inside as you do on the outside. Let's hope so. Thank you. And that's a key, right? That's a key. And I think about that a lot, you know, having had a med spa, spend all this on external, external beauty to the, you know, to be beautiful on the outside, you've got to be beautiful on the inside. But our research showed that more important than measuring your cholesterol or even your blood pressure, I mean, the two risk factors that to me are the most important are your blood sugar and your blood pressure. Blood sugar determines whether you're, you know, burning up tissues, whether you're growing plaque and whether your brain shrinking. I mean, so blood sugar is the number one cause for heart disease. A measure of function of your arteries is your blood pressure. If your blood pressure is not one to less than, it should be less than 120 over 80 without medication. If not, you're probably growing plaque at an accelerated rate. And oftentimes the doctor says, oh, your blood pressure is elevated, but you're fine. No, you're not fine if your blood pressure is elevated. Your arteries are sick and something's wrong. And you can change that with nutrients, food, and activity, and stress management. So, um, yeah, and then uh, probably the third really critical thing that's new, that if you'd asked me about this 10 years ago, I would have been unaware of it, but the gut microbiome, those bacteria and bugs in our gut, have a big impact on heart disease. So to me, those are the three critical factors, blood sugar, blood pressure, and gut microbiome that really influence our risk for heart disease if, and our circulation. So that's, and yes, cholesterol has some small effect, but that's far less important than I think these other factors. That is so, such a powerful statement because it's harped on cholesterol, 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 and we know we can lower it too much. And we need to look at the full panel of it and, and see what's happening because we need cholesterol to make our testosterone, to make our hormones, to make our DHEA, to make our, you know, we, we need that testosterone. So let's, you know, I really want to touch on blood pressure management. I did, you know, for my audience, I, you guys, if you haven't watched the show I did with Dr. Jeffrey Life, we talked about sexual function in men and he really um, emphasized the blood pressure management. So check out that girlfriend doctor show with Dr. Jeffrey Life. That is a great, great, great show. And I want to address that with you too, Stephen, when you're seeing this, you know, and, and you're going to put someone on their lifestyle recommendations, and we're going to get to some four key aspects of that, of the, of your, of your key steps. But, um, you know, how are you managing like blood pressure? What are you using? What's your first line of therapy? Okay. So when you go to a typical doctor's office and they see your blood pressure up, they go eat better, lose weight, exercise, and we'll recheck it in a month. And if it's still up, we'll put you on a medication. And three fourths of the time, they don't start you on only one medication. You'll end up needing two or three meds that in the end actually make you feel worse. So here's another approach. What if your blood pressure was up and your doctor said, ah, your blood pressure's up. That's a sign your lifestyle doesn't match your genetic need. So here's my list of things you can do. First would be eating more vegetables and fruits, colorful ones, not fruit juice, but real fruits and vegetables that have those pigments and have fiber, because eating five cups of those a day has a bigger impact on your blood pressure than taking a cholesterol drug. Second, as you said, a workout, being fit. 
your fitness, a high intensity workout is going to do on a regular basis is going to do more to lower your blood pressure than will taking a drug that makes you feel worse. And exercise makes you feel better. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Number three of the two white powders that are bad for that are bad for us that we talk about commonly like sugar and salt. Sugar. Oh, I thought you were going to say cocaine and no sugar and salt of the two salt does impact some people's a third of people's blood pressure in a moderate way but sugar has a much bigger factor i couldn't agree more i couldn't agree more we need the minerals in salt so it, it, all the sugar substitutes like corn syrup and agave and all of those things and and also flour flour when you take a grain and grind it up that whole wheat flour or white flour by weight have the same impact on your blood sugar as table sugar. So sugar and flour, cutting that out will have a bigger improvement on your blood pressure than a drug. Meditation, you know, you and I are both big proponents of managing our stress and, you know, either meditation or using heart math can be as effective as adding a drug. Yeah, you know, when you said sugar substitutes like agave, I was just like, okay, well, I, do, I did take that out of my margaritas. No more agave in my margaritas, no. Stephen. Yeah, agave, it gives you fatty liver. It turns your liver into pate to use oh, agave. Good. Oh, oh, that is a great, that's a great quote. That's yeah, if you want to, yeah, have, you know, fill your bloodstream with triglycerides, fats, and convert your liver into pate use agave i don't recommend it there you go okay we're not doing that we're not converting our livers into pate no way that good fatty that fatty liver that delicious pate no not for our livers i got it yes and then nutrient deficiencies several nutrients if they're low raise your blood pressure number one is probably magnesium 70 percent of people have low magnesium levels if that's if you're more than the 50 percent and it's you and you're low, boosting your magnesium levels will lower your blood pressure. Um, you know, so magnesium, potassium, CoQ10, if those are low, it lowers your, it raises your blood pressure and increases your risk for heart disease. And ironically, statin meds worse to do several things. So yes, they'll help men a lot more than they would ever help women. Um, but and. For some people who are very high risk, they have some, they do have some real true benefit. But for many people, statin meds do several things. They lower your testosterone, as you know, that's not a great thing. You might have to take testosterone if you're on a cholesterol lowering med. Uh, they, they can cause muscle aches so you don't feel like working out. That's not great for your heart. They raise your blood sugar. That's not a good thing. They can cause brain fog and memory loss. That's also a bad thing. But they lower CoQ10 levels, which gives you energy. They block the conversion of K1 to vitamin K2, which makes your arteries grow plaque. So, so I'm not opposed to anybody using a statin med. My goal would be to make it so that 90% of people on them don't need them. But if you're on them, they can have serious side effects that can actually make heart issues worse. So it's important we address those and cover all those issues for anybody taking cholesterol. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And it aggravates me today when I was evaluating a um, gentleman's lab, 53 years old, turning 54, and on a statin medication for five years, not on CoQ10 not on a CoQ10, family history of heart disease on both sides, low testosterone, not at, at 370 within range of normal, but definitely low testosterone. And his total cholesterol, they've lowered it with the statin meds to a total cholesterol of 110. And he's a type A pattern. I ran, I ran lipopolysaccharides, you know, and, and all the, you know, all the, fractionated cholesterol numbers and, you know, type A pattern you know, was 240, now it's down to 110, and um, he doesn't feel good. Well, yeah, so if you are on a statin for an important reason, then many things you can do to offset these, you know, like taking CoQ10, like taking vitamin K2. Um, there's a pathway that has to do with journal, journal. I, you've probably seen that, 
Whereas if we add this compound, it helps stop the muscle aches, it helps restore some of the testosterone, it helps with many ways in the help convert the K1 to K vitamin K2, and helps with K CoQ10 formation. So by adding one of the unintentional things that's blocked back, we can actually undo some of these changes we see from th that medication and help people's quality of life. And you know, my, again, my goal is, the, it's not that the meds are bad, it's that if you follow the right lifestyle choices, you won't need the medication, you won't be, they won't be indicated. You can stop them safely while, while working with your physician. I do not mean just throw them away, no. You know, I couldn't agree more. There's a time and a place for it all, right? There is, and the ideal is that, look, when you're prescribed something, doesn't mean you're on it for life. If you reverse the changes that caused you to have the problem to begin with, you'll be able to come off this medication. Like in the case of uh, this man with his cholesterol at 110 now, total cholesterol, that's way low. So he can be backed off some of his medication. Yeah, I wonder what the poor guy's testosterone levels are. They're probably pretty low too. 370, total of 370. Oh. We like, I like it 600 to 1,000, you know, yes. in the sweet spot. Now let's get into the gut microbiome. I mean, this is so, I mean, from oral health gut microbiome, our nutritional um, impact, like what, how our nutrition impacts our gut microbiome and some of the different uh, philosophies out there, trends of diets out there and how that impacts our gut microbiome. This is really, really important. And this is where I think men get away with a lot more than women, Stephen, because men have 10 times as much testosterone as women. And so like, you know, and and for our audience, like testosterone is a hormone that builds up your bone, builds up your muscle, makes you stronger, you know, more solid, right? And it's an anabolic hormone. And, you know, when we're, you know, women 10 times less, and when we're stressed, cortisol, I mean, cortisol is going to, is a catabolic hormone. It breaks us down. It makes us more susceptible to, of course, illness, disease, inflammation, hormone imbalance that are, that are so critical. And, and the gut is impacted by all of this. Your gut, it does so many things. You know, it, I think we've known for some time, at least a decade or 20, you know, in functional medicine, probably for 30 years now, we've talked about how the gut microbiome causes gut dysbiosis, gut symptoms, leaky gut syndrome, it's evolved. But maybe in the last 10 years, we started realizing the gut influenced your brain. It was like the second brain. I mean, the brain hormone, the brain neurotransmitters, most of them come, are produced in the gut. And then we realized there was the weight loss connection, that if you had the wrong gut microbes, you would gain weight despite what you ate. And if you had the right ones, you could lose weight. And more recently, we've realized it impacts all the, the heart risk factors, your cholesterol, your blood pressure, your blood sugar, your waistline, and your inflammation levels that all of those are heavily related to the gut microbiome. In fact, the gut microbiome is, and leaky gut's probably the number one cause for systemic in inflammation. Number two, you mentioned it, is the oral, you know, the gingiva, the mouth, is probably the second leading cause of inflammation. So very important. But now we realize if you eat the wrong foods, as an example, if you eat lots of sugar and, and just red meat, you, you're going to form more TMAO, bacteria that produce a compound that increases your risk for heart disease and increases clotting and artery constriction by 62%. Much bigger risk factor than elevated cholesterol would be is if you make too much TMAO, trimethylamine oxide, that comes from gut back, the wrong gut bacteria that make this compound. So, to me, if people thought they could be vegan, or a lot easier, probably from my perspective, maybe even healthier, is more of a Mediterranean diet um, that's going to help you have gut flora that are healthy and balanced and not make TMAO and reduce your risk and make you feel better. So, yeah, it's, it's been startling how important a risk factor your gut microbiome is for heart disease and all the risks that, risk factors associated with heart disease. 
And I think that's one of the crucial findings. I, I don't know if you have your Mediterranean diet book there with you, but um, that you released in 2020, 2019, 2020, right? Just yes. on the new year. Yeah, yeah, with me, with my Keto Green 16, right in the middle of a pandemic. But listen, you guys get those books, Keto Green 16 and the Mediterranean diet. Dr. masley has been traveling around the Mediterranean and is just a fabulous fabulous chef and the herbs and spices to make everything fun and tasteful, but also medicinal food is medicine. He's, he's, you know, just creating these great combinations. And I think that's one of the biggest things is like we're in the keto world in the carnival world. It's like, okay, you know, you guys, the gut microbiome for the long call requires diversity within our diet from herbs, spices, plants, and this nutritional this nutritional basis. And I want you to comment on that because there is a lot of confusion around that. One of our keys is to get those nutrient intakes. So of all the keto diets out there, you know, yours is one of my favorite in that it focuses on adding green, green leafies and promoting alkalinity. Because if you're just eating meat and, and you know, if that's all you're, you're on a bacon and cheese diet and you're not getting those greens, you become acidic, you lose bone mass, you lose all these, your health falls apart. So if you are, you know, it's key, no matter what we're doing to meet our nutrient need. And berries and green leafies, those pigments are an essential part. One, those colors in the fiber are essential feeding source for our gut microbiome. That's what they use for fuel. So. If you could take all the probiotic supplements you want, but if you don't get that colorful plant-based pigment and fiber, they won't survive. They'll starve to death. That's what their food source is. We, our gut microbes and us are this symbiotic relationship where we need that. So the right plant pigments, the right nutrients, the right fats, all of that is an essential part of optimal health and making a difference. Deborah thought she'd never be able to enjoy sex again until she tried Jolva, my all-natural anti-aging cream for your delicate feminine parts. She had tried all sorts of herbs and oils and even estrogen, but nothing worked as well as Jolva to rejuvenate her feminine bits and bring fireworks back into the bedroom. Well, find Jolva at dranna.com and use the code SHOW10 to get 10% off your first order. So talk about like the ideal, the ideal day, then an ideal day in your life, an ideal day in, in, uh, you know, a perimenopausal, menopausal woman's life and compare and contrast, you know, like if there any comparison between men and women in, in approaching a heart healthy uh, diet, that's really addressing the gut microbiome, like first steps. So of the foods I want people to add, number one is colorful fiber. And I'm not into grains as a fiber source because they have such a big blood sugar response. So I would prefer that people get their, their fiber from vegetable, fruit, beans, nuts, dark chocolate. Those would be their sources, not the grains. Um, so that, that would be the number one source. Number two are healthy fats. I, you know, I'm, I'm way over. You, you know that back in the 90s, I worked as the medical director at the Predican Longevity Center. It was an ultra low fat diet. None, none of my patients were able to follow it on a long-term basis. Many of them had jumps in their blood sugar levels and oftentimes they felt worse doing that. So on, a, on that long-term basis when they tried to stick with it. So we need, our brain needs healthy fat, our hormones need healthy fat. And it helps with blood sugar control. So fiber, healthy fats, clean protein. My, my essential for protein is it's clean. I'm far less concerned about whether it has saturated fat or not, or whether it doesn't have hormones and pesticides and herbicides in it. So clean protein, beneficial beverages is another essential of those food groups because way too many people are drinking sweetened beverages or artificially sweetened beverages and those artificial sweeteners the pink and yellow and um, blue packs kill the gut microbiome mm. and it creates insulin resistant it's the cruelest you know it's the cruelest twist really because it's as i say a cruel joke against 
uh, women and men. I mean, because it makes you fatter. It really does. Increases cravings, makes you fatter, increases obesity, insulin resistant, diabetes. I mean, it's just terrible. No artificial sweeteners, none of those diet drinks. I mean, please, 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 if you're hearing anything, believe me, once you cleanse your palate, like in a 10 day, in, in a, you know, a 10 day keto green detox or Dr. Masley's you know, following his 30 day heart plan. I mean, you, your taste buds will come back to life and you will, you will love eating no sugar stuff. And Very good point. That over and over and over again. And plus fat is satisfying. So you don't have to rely on willpower because you won't be hungry because we're balanced the menus so that you're not hungry. People are not going to be able to rely on willpower. Willpower is going to get you through a few hours, maybe. <laughs> But if you've got cravings, they're overwhelming. And really, nobody's able to use willpower. To, so we have to use a lot more common sense than that than trying to rely on willpower and calorie counting, which aren't going to work. So Yes, I'm into that. I'm into that, for sure. And lastly, um, some source of probiotics. You know, whether it's if you're able to use dairy, many people are dairy intolerant, but you can. I'm, I'm fine with organic yogurt and kefir. But if you're dairy sensitive, and many people are, then you're looking for probiotics from another source, you know, whether that's miso or sauerkraut or pickled. There's so many ways to get probiotics today that that's, so those are my five key food groups that I really have people focus on. And, and while they're avoiding sugar and flour, they're focusing on these five food groups. Can you go through the five again for us? Go through the five. Colorful fiber, not from a whole grain, please. So vegetable, fruit, beans, and nuts, colorful sources. Number two are smart fats. Number three would be um, clean protein. Number four are beneficial beverages, those that have pigments in it, like tea. I'm, I'm good with coffee and tea and red wine, all three of those in moderation, but lots of water and green and green drinks. You know, your Mighty thing. Maca Plus. Absolutely. Where is it? Over here. Got to get that in. Seriously, alkalinizing. I can put in with my smoothie when I have a smoothie. So I use it. I've got that. So uh, that, t that makes me happy. Thank you, Stephen. And another thing that I think I've really adapted more recently is partial intermittent fasting. The idea of several days a week, not eating from nine at night. And for me, and nine at night until noon the next day. What time you do is you can shift it to meet your needs. But idea of a 14, 15 hour fast, several days per week. Um, I think in that ketosis has benefit and it helps with insulin sensitivity. I mean, many things that I think, so those are my real themes that I'm focusing on that I think overlap in many ways with what you're trying to teach as well. Absolutely. And what I, I love is, you know, focusing on that intermittent fasting for both men and women. Let me tell you, like getting into ketosis isn't just necessary for women, it's mandatory. Because the whole concept of our brain's use of fuel and our two times as much risk in Alzheimer, gluconeogenesis in the brain is estrogen dependent, right? When I found that out, it was like an aha moment because in ketosis, um, in, when I'm keto alkaline or keto green, right, that combination, um, in, and I'm in ketosis, my brain's on fire. It's lit up. I am, you know, alert. And when I'm not, I have the, you know, the brain fog. It doesn't matter, even if it's so, so interesting, even with supplementation of estrogen, that can help a little bit and progesterone, certainly. But getting it, shifting into ketosis, I mean, it is, and you, we need as women to intermittent fast. We need to extend fast and we need to really restrict those carbs. And I, and I think there's a couple of things that I want to address here. I definitely am on like eat dinner by five, break fast by 9 a.m., something like that. It really depends uh, because I do work out. I do work out fasting in the morning and I like to break fast, you know, within a couple hours after. And I want to talk about that exercise schedule, but I do on your number four beneficial beverages, um, alkaline water. What do you think about alkaline water, mineral water? As I sip my Topa Chico, because I'm in Texas and I'm addicted to Topa Chico, and then there's the ranch water too. Don't I think the most important source of alkalinity though comes from vegetables, fruit, beans, nuts. Those plant sources are, are going to be the most powerful source of alkalinity that we're going to get like your greens that you always talk about greens. Um, that's gonna give you 
the big boost in alkalinity. You can get an additional boost with the fluids you drink for alkalinity. But to me, most of it comes from the greens, the fruit and vegetables, that those sources, and cutting out the acidic foods that um, you know, can tend to bleed that, especially refined yeah. grains that seem to decrease our alkalinity. And create addiction and loss of willpower with those refined grains. There's a great little bakery, Artisan Boulangerie, that opened up down the street. It's very, very tempting. It's definitely like that addictive kind of pull, those chocolate croissants. They're a really authentic French croissant. Anyway, what do I know? So, but with that, I mean, it's so true, but we want clean water. We don't want to drink out of plastic bottles, clean, filtered. Glass. Glass, exactly. And if you're going to buy something, can I recommend my Topa Chica <laughs> mineral water here in, in Texas? So, no, I, I love, I'm totally on board with everything you're saying. And I think it's so important. But what about like when you exercise and fast? So I'm not a big proponent of when you need to exercise. So and here, here's the data that I think I've, we've talked about in the past from our clinic. It's not about how many minutes you spend. It's about how fit you are. And your aerobic fitness has a huge impact on many aspects of your health, your blood sugar control, your brain, your heart function. But strength training does too. So we need both. We need muscle mass and we need aerobic capacity. And, and they are each independently very strong predictors of not having heart disease, not having memory loss, not having diabetes. And so high intensity workout several days a week, some strength training a couple days a week. I love to throw in yoga a couple days a week. That to me is like an ideal, so what time of day you wanna work out, my preference is to do it first thing in the morning. But I've realized over time, it's less important what time than you actually do it. So if there's a time that works for you, who sees it, please seize that time and do it regularly and make it part of your schedule. That to me is the most important thing. And, you know, get up a sweat, you know, get huffing and puffing and you feel so much better for doing that. It's amazing. And when should you eat after like, you know, do you, does it matter like eating before eating after in your experience? Is you know, I think people are individually different. This is not where I, I, I'm not a believer in that we all respond to food. So, I mean, there were years that went by where I always wanted to have like a shake before my workout. And I thought I felt better. But you know, once I got used to partial intermittent fasting and I gotten in a routine, I can't, honestly, I can't tell a difference. So, but when I talk to my patients, I realize some of them clearly need to eat something before they, if they're gonna do an intense workout, if they don't eat something, they don't have the energy for the workout. So by all means, they should have like, a, you know, a green protein shake before their exercise session. But if you don't, some people literally say, I feel so much better if I eat after I've worked out. From a muscle mass perspective, you do want to add some protein with, on the days you do strength training. So if you really push your muscles a couple days a week, you'll help build more muscle mass. If you get a boost and put some protein powder in your drink within 30 minutes, of that and it's better in a liquid form because you had better absorbed than sometimes solid protein but you could even eat you know chicken or fish or you know some other source of vegan protein would be fine as well but we do need protein after strength training sessions. that's the one that's really timing to fit important to me um that everybody has for a strength training session is going to do have a benefit to have some protein after that strength training session. Before your aerobic session, what makes you feel better? What enhances your performance? That's what I would recommend they go. Yes, yes, and um, I, I'm with you on that. I'm gonna just re repeat what you said. It's not how much you exercise, it's how fit you are. You guys, yes. that is a message to live by. It's not how much you exercise, it's how fit you are. And I think that's that's a really crucial a crucial statement because we want that cardiovascular fitness all the way around. And um, I appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Masley, will you give us some examples, a patient example in your clinic that came in and 
followed your 30 day heart tune up and what happened. Now I did see, I personally, you got, you know, I have seen before and afters in, in Dr. Masley's clinics of patients and ultrasounding for the uh, carotid intimal medial thickness and seeing that improve over time, heart without drugs or medication, seeing this heart disease re reduce. And that's how much power we have over our body. So I want, I would love for you to give um, a great case example. A typical might be, you know, a woman who comes in, she's tired, she's got brain fog, her waistline's expanding, and she's trying to work out. She's trying to exercise. She, you know, too often they might be on a low fat diet or something like that. And they're eating all these whole grain products for their fiber intake. And their blood sugars might be my, just mildly elevated or at the top of normal. And they, their quality of life just said their weight's going up, their blood sugar's creeping up, their waistline's expanding. The, the biggest symptoms are fatigue, brain fog, drop in sexual libido, and they want their life back. So I think the key is right food, meet your nutrient needs, the right workout, some stress management. And typically the reason I say this 30 day heart tune up is because I usually follow people up at 30 days. And at 30 days, I'm used to seeing they feel better, they sleep better. Their spouse says, or their partner says, wow, your sexual function, what, what happened? I like it. <laughs> And I'm stopping some of their medications at the 30-day mark. I'm like, okay, your cholesterol's dropped quite a bit. You don't need this cholesterol med. You don't need this blood sugar med. You don't need the blood pressure med. And they feel better as we wean that off. So 30 days to me is really a nice time frame to see a dramatic difference in people's life when they follow those pillars. Can you go over those five key things again? Food, nutrients, fitness, stress management, those are really the four, the four keys right there. I mean, there's toxin exposures as well we could get into. I think that much more important for your brain, maybe your blood sugar control for your hormones, but for your heart, I think it's those four key ones. I think we're convinced our audience. They're like, okay, I'm paying more attention. I'm gonna follow, follow this more to giving up sugar. And I'm gonna ask you like three, Three final, three final questions is if there was only one meal you could eat, this was like not necessarily your last meal, but this is the one meal, like you want this meal, what would that be? That's a hard one for me. I, I eat something different. I mean, I don't have the same meal maybe in a month. What's your favorite? I have 50 favorites. Oh, give me one, Steven. Okay. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Um, Chiopino would be an example, you know, so a seafood stew with some veggies and a wonderful broth and, a, and a, with this lovely tossed green leafy salad. So that would be an example or a, a stir, you know, so um, I'm, it might be, you know, wild salmon with a stir fry of veggies that are steamed and put in some lemon and olive oil and a little salt and garlic and on the side so a smoothie i like smoothies during the day with berries okay, but that would not be your last meal Stephen. i know i love smoothies too i'm big on keto greens but that would not be my last meal. dark chocolate you know dark chocolate with nuts and berries oh there would be dark chocolate with my meal too okay thank you and i know it's hard for you because let me your mediterranean diet book your books, amazing recipes. I mean, you got Spanish and Italian and French and Greek and Turkish and Egyptian and Lebanese and Moroccan and Cyprus and Sicily and Crete. And every one of those places has a meal to die for. Yes, yes, absolutely. I'm with you. I'm with you. Okay, so your second thing, what would be your guilty pleasure? You don't have to feel guilty over it. What's your like guilty pleasure? You're like, oh, my guilty pleasure. Um, well, it's probably chocolate, dark chocolate to excess, or, you know, red wine is good for me in moderation, but it'd be having more than one glass of red wine, you know, so. Or having them together, chocolate them and together. red wine. That's yes. the best. Okay, good. And then, okay. And in, for our, our listeners, they're like, okay, we've gotten a lot of information here. 
what is the number one needle mover that you can tell them, okay, today you're just going to start with this first step, your number one needle mover first step? It's food. I mean, the food you choose is going to have the biggest impact on how you feel. Uh, you know, so if you eat the wrong food, you don't feel like working out, you don't feel like proactively manage your stress. You know, so when you feel great because you got the right fuel, fuel, everything else I think is easier. So, I, you know, one of the things my patients have always said to me and my readers in my book say to me is I forgot how great I could feel because they've been dwindling, dwindling, dwindling for so long, we're talking years and decades, that they're used to feeling mediocre at best. And it's like, I can't tell you how many times someone says, thank you for giving my life back. I forgot how great I could feel. That's really what makes to me it all worthwhile. It's that giving someone the tools to transform their life, to feel better and save their life at the same time. And so the way their family, friends, their coworkers, they can all tell, it's obvious. Wow, what happened to you? Um, that's what makes it worthwhile to me. And um, that's what I like. That's the sensation I'm looking for is that people just say, wow. Yeah, and, and this is the difference too in, in your philosophy, what we do. It's a long-term win. It's not the short-term weight loss. It's not the short-term, you know, result, it's the long-term result, the long-term improvements, the quality of life improvements and the energy that we bring home to ourselves, our families, our relationships, and, and how meaningful is that? Absolutely, that's, that's yeah. what it's all about. Well, tell our audience where they can get a hold of you, your, your work, and, and find you. Well, books, wherever their books are sold, online or in bookstores, but you know, the easiest place to get more information is at the website, drmasley.com, D-R-M-A-S-L-E-Y.com. I've got a blog. I send out recipe, new recipes a couple times per month, and I send a couple health tip articles out per month to help people optimize how they feel, and sometimes I'll promote another book like yours. <laughs> um, awesome. So awesome. That, that's probably the best way is the fall is the visit the website. It's free. And on the blog, you can unsubscribe at any time. Um, that's the easiest way for me to stay connected and make the biggest difference in people's lives. Mm, well, thank you so much. Thank you for being here. And I look forward to coming out to your sailboat sometime while you're sailing along the Mediterranean and joining you and Nicole for a little while. <laughs> We've got that on our schedule. We got to get that on our schedule. Okay. All right. Well, um, thank you, Dr. Masley, for being here. And we'll be right back. This truly has been a wonderful journey into heart disease in both men and women and how the steps that we need to take to reverse and heal heart disease is 90% in our control, as Dr. Masley said, 90%. So the answer is not in solely, right? Managing your cholesterol. And we hit on those really key points, as well as the importance of blood pressure management, blood sugar management. And again, 90% is lifestyle. It's in your control. So I want to definitely encourage you to get the 30-day heart tune-up by Dr. Stephen Masley. Check out his work, his recipes, his science behind that. And to emphasize how important the gut microbiome is. So that green aspect of keto green, the using low carbohydrate vegetables, fibers to feed the gut, fermented foods that we can incorporate into the gut. You guys, all my recipes in Keto Green 16 and the Hormone Fix are helping you in this journey. And be sure, be sure to share your own. I love it when you tag a Keto Green recipe and tag me at the Girlfriend Doctor on my Instagram and my Facebook. But I really want to encourage you to do that because I get inspired by your recipes too. So get Keto Green, follow up with me. And for more information, go to dranna.com forward slash show. And that's where you can ask or tell me anything. So be sure to let me know what your take homes are and be sure to watch this video if you can on YouTube and subscribe and get notifications so that you know as soon as we have this video out. I thank you again for being here and I look forward to seeing you next time.
Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel here and get those notifications and comment below. Let me know your thoughts, what you loved and what your action step is.